Okay, so what we're going to do here today is we're going to show how to perform a hatch residue analysis um, when we pull our eggs and our hatch baskets out of the incubator. One of the first things we do is, is a lot of times we'll determine which flocks we're going to be looking at in case we're doing a, um, a clear egg separator or whatever because we want a full complement of eggs that were set. Um, we obviously need to know how many eggs were in the basket, which most of us will know the way we set our eggs. When we take the hatch, the, the hatch basket, it'll have all the eggs in there, the, the shells from the chicks that hatched, the unhatched eggs, and then even chicks. So first thing we want to do is take a general observation of that hatch basket. We want to look at the eggs. We want to look, um, you know, if there's any merconium, any uh, other debris here, any um, problems that chicks maybe struggled to get out and left um, some residue around that, the eggs there. We want to look at the eggs themselves, um, maybe break some eggshells, kind of feel the quality of those eggshells. Are they really brittle? Are they really stiff? The other thing we want to do is look at um, the, the shells and look at the, the pip line because we want that pip line to be proper. We don't want it to be too high where they may not have lost enough moisture. If they're too low, they would have lost too much moisture. So we want that pip line about a third of the way on the egg. So we want to look at that um, and evaluate before we start anything else. So once we get this basket out, we'll then um, typically, we want a place to dispose of our uh, the, the waste as we break the eggs open. Um, this is a training video, so maybe a little bit slower than what somebody normally would do. We'll have prepared for us um, a, a breakout sheet. Every company is a little bit different, but where we can categorize what we're seeing here. And then often you'll have an extra person there to tally the marks of what we're seeing, whether they're early dead, late dead, um, the incidents, we'll talk about each of those. So um, once we have that already, a place to dispose of our chicks, we'll then kind of separate out the eggs, uh, the, the shells and the eggs. And different ways to do this, some people will take all the eggs out and put them in a flat and they can do this later after they've examined that. Other times we'll do the breakout directly from um, the hatch basket. So we're going to do it directly from the hatch basket today and pull the eggs, um, some of the eggs out. So we've got one. Obviously, what I like to do is I like to pull out the eggs first. Actually, I like to pull out any chicks that um, hatched but, but died before we got to this point. That point, make sure that they are indeed dead. If not, we need to practice animal welfare and, and do a cervical dislocation, um, take care of them and euthanize them. And then we'll take those out and record those. We have to make sure that every unhatched egg in this basket is recorded somewhere on your sheet. If it's a contaminated egg, it can be contaminated, but it also has to be categorized as infertile, early dead, late dead, whatever. Everything's because we've got to have a proper um, documentation. So this chick, what I do with a, a, a chick that's been hatched but is dead, I'll categorize that as a cold chick. That needs to be included in your total of, of your eggs that were set. What I do, generally do then after that is I will go and pull any pipped, pipped out that I can see. And so this is a pip. We can see here where the, the chicks started to pip out. I like to then, I think this is important when we do a residue breakout is we wanna see the position of the chick in the egg. So we don't wanna just yank it open. We wanna take it open gently enough, not too slow, because we wanna get this process done, that we can see the position. We wanna see if it's positioned right, if that head is under that right wing, if it's head to the right side, um, if it's positioned right in that egg. So we can see that from um, their initial observation. We want to open it gently. You see the internal pipping. It pipped in through that internal membrane into the air cell. So that would be a category you may um, cover. A lot of people don't or everybody doesn't. So then we look at the position of the embryo. Here's the head. Where's that wing? This wing's here. It was kind of down there. So this was kind of considered it's it's sort of underneath that wing but it's a little bit malpositioned um, the per correct position is going to be head under the wing like this and not over the wing this one is kind of next to it i would consider this more of a normal position as it starts circulating around that egg it'll it'll hatch out properly but we see that again grab it by the back of the neck pull it out slowly you can see the position of the whole embryo look at the contents of the yolk is it withdrawn this is all withdrawn in internal pip let's say this is probably a day um, 20, maybe a 19. Um, either way, it's a 19 to 21. It's a late dead embryo with all that yolk withdrawn in there. That will occur on the 19th day. Um, so this would be um, either late 19 or early 20 
embryo mortality. Make sure, this is important, make sure that if we are valuing these, if we have one that is a live pit before we dispose of it, we need to euthanize it properly so we're not just um, disposing of the chicks, uh, of live chicks. So we can another, this egg here does not have a, a pit mark. So we want to break the, you can use a little knife or scalpel to break, break the egg. So we'll pull that open. I like to pull it open, again, slow enough, but again, we'll, we'll get um, a little bit faster as we go along to see, was it an internal pip? This, this one did not pip internally. The chick will pip into the air cell before it pips through to the shell. And that would be called an internal pip. So we can see the position of this chick. It never did pip um, into the air cell. So this is not an internal pip. Again, we can see the position and the position of this chick again is, would be considered a malposition. The head is not under the right wing. It's over the right wing. Same process then. I'll reach under, grab it by the back of the head, pull it out slowly so we can see the position that it had inside that egg. The other thing we will then do is pull out and look at the amount of yolk that is absorbed into the body. By the 19th day, the majority of that yolk sac should be withdrawn into that body. You might have a little bit out, but the majority should be withdrawn in. This has a, a, a significant amount of yolk sac there, so I would say this would be likely an 18-day embryo, died in that 18th day, possibly before transfer or during transfer process. Not that the transfer process caused it, but I would say because of the amount of yolk there, that that would be typically an 18 day. So record that 18 day um, embryo. That would be categorized in your late, in your late dead. Okay, this one, um, interesting to look at, we can talk about. It's a pip chick, pipped egg. Um, because if we use the InnovoJet system, we can then look and the, the, we can tell the chick is oriented on the wrong end of the egg. It's trying to pip out of the small end of the egg. There's no sign of an of a injection site for the InnovoJet which means that this egg was set upside down. So the injection site's up here on top. Because it was set upside down, that chick was oriented upside down. So you would often have a category of upside down eggs. This one was definitely set upside down. With the InnovoJet system, we can tell that now, as we can determine if they were set upside down or not by the site that may or may not be present. So this chick is a live pip, counted as a live pip. You can hear it pipping. It's um, malpositioned because it's upside down in that egg. Um, it's malpositioned because it was upside down. We'll pull it out, look at the development. Of course, it did go to 21 days. Um, all the yolk is withdrawn. Um, so we've recorded that. Again, we always want to make sure and euthanize the chicks properly because um, we don't want to put any, any live chicks in, in a basket. There's another one. We look at the pip line. The pip line is good. It was set properly. It's got an uh, injection site on top. It is another live pip. Um, Make note of the position. Mal uh, the position was correct. The head is under the right wing. Um, everything else about it looks good. The position, um, orientation, everything, it just failed to hatch. So this would be considered a, a live pip. We would then have to count it as a 21 day dead as well because everything has to be recorded in, in a, as either a fertile, infertile, or a embryo mortality at some point. Um, another egg here. We don't see any signs on this egg. So this one now, we're looking into our early um, mortality. We don't have an embryo. And we then start looking at some specific signs. There's blood in this embryo here. Probably can't see it. And so we want to look at a couple of things first to separate our early and mid date. So this one, um, hopefully you can see that here. Right on the um, edge of that egg, you see a little black dot. That is the pigmentation of the eye. and that pigmentation becomes prominent on a day four embryo. So for me, I like to differentiate between our zero to three dead embryo, day embryos and our four to seven day. And this is a very good representation of that pigmentation of eye coming on the, on the fourth day. So that would move it into that four day. Still a first week embryo mortality. I will say that we don't want to necessarily look hard for that pigmentation. It needs to be prominent. So it needs to be there. So um, you see that, that eye pigmentation is very prominent, stand out, um, and so that's what we would um, call our uh, like a four-day embryo. If you're doing clear egg removal, a lot of these will be gone, and so we won't have these early embryo mortalities to record. Um, so record that properly. Um, again, we won't go through all the eggs here, but um, if we've got our infertile 
an early dead. We'll look at some fertility check in, a, in another video. We'll also look at some chick quality issues in another video. Um, but this is the basic process of doing a residue analysis. Everything's got to be recorded. We need to know how many eggs we started with. We need to know how many total are in this basket. And of that total, those all have to be counted as either an infertile or some sort of embryo mortality. I like to, I, I say from a biological standpoint, we're gonna have four to five percent total embryo loss. That's early, middle, late. That's that's somewhat acceptable from a biological standpoint. As we do one of the other training videos, we'll talk about troubleshooting the, the hatch resident analysis. That's where we really look at the numbers we generate from doing this process. Um, and then once we generate these numbers, it's very important then take those numbers, sit down with the hatchery manager, hatchery personnel, evaluate them, see what's off, um, see what areas we might have improvement, um, areas if we, if we have dehydration or, or uh, a lot of green chicks, but the, the numbers will tell us that. Okay, we've shown you how to um, evaluate our hatch residue once we get eggs in the basket, all the unhatched eggs in a basket. And now that we're looking for specific items in there, it's really important to be able to collect accurate data. So once we look at the, the, the unhatched eggs, um, we need to be able to categorize them properly. So a chart that I use, um, again, this is not the only way to do it, but this is the way I do it, um, allows me to properly categorize um, the unhatched um, eggs into uh, the proper places. First of all, one of our most important items, of course, is being able to dis distinguish between fertile and infertile eggs. So we need to have a category for infertility. We need to have an area to record our um, early deads, our zero to three, four to seven. Those are all encompass our one week mortality, first week mortality. And then also our last week um, mortality. I like to break it down between 15 and 18 days in that range and 19 to 21 because that um, separates the time of transfer. Most of our eggs are transferred around that 18th day. So we can have pre-transfer and post-transfer a late death. So this is kind of the chart I use. Um, then the rest of the chart, um, every, every egg needs, needs to be categorized as either infertile or some sort of mortality. And then all the things at the bottom of that chart there are in addition. You can have a 21 day old embryo that was a dead pip, a malposition, and an exposed brain, but it still would be a tally mark in the 19 to 21 day because it is still a dead embryo. Everything has to be recorded there. So I like to look at some very distinguishing factors um, that really help me to put um, the unhatched eggs um, in the right category. Of course, we have the fertile eggs, either infertile or fertile, and then we have some other um, points of development. Day four, they get pigmentation of the eye. Day eight, an egg tooth is present. Day 15, chick down is prominent and present. And day 19, the yolk sac is drawn into the body. And again, day four, pigmentation, it must be prominent. Day eight, egg tooth present must be prominent, easily identifiable. So in our first category, infertile and fertile eggs, of course, we're looking for the infertile eggs, those with a very tight, compact um, germal disc, uh, no uh, signs of, a, of development, cellular development, like we see the egg on the right, the fertile egg. We start to see that donut-shaped um, growth of that embryo. That would distinguish between the one on the left being infertile, one on the right being fertile. And then we have various stages of embryo development um, before they died, and we'll talk about some of those. So what we're looking for, the pigmentation of the eye, in four days, we see that eye pigmented. At eight days, we see an egg tooth. Um, very prominent, should be easily easy to see. Um, at day 15, we see prominent down covering. Day 19, we'll see the yolk sac mostly withdrawn into the body. So th that's why I break these eggs apart and put them in the proper category. So here again is our different categories. And we can look at each one. Fertile eggs, donut shaped germal discs would determine they were fertile. Then they died at various stages after that. Could be a blood ring or developed to the point of having eye pigmentation, whatever. But if we see any stages of development, it counts as a at least a zero to three day old embryo. No development, compact germal disc will have an infertile egg. Um, and then day four, eye pigmentation becomes prominent. It would go into the four to seven day category. If we don't see an egg tooth, it'll stay in that category. Once we 
see a prominent egg tooth that will be tallied then in the 8-14 day category, which is the middle stage of, of embryo development. By day 15, the chick down is prominent. It will then be, if we have a mortality here, it will then be in the 15 to 18 day um, group. And day 19, yolk sac is mostly withdrawn into the body. If that occurs and later, we will see, uh, we record that in the 19-21 day old um, group. So each of these um, categories that I, that I mentioned here are very easy to distinguish and will allow us to put um, the, the unhatched eggs into one of these categories. Again, we could have um, live pips and upside downs and mal positions also um, recorded on here, but every egg needs to be in one of these categories, every unhatched egg. And when we look at our mortality um, patterns, we typically will see high mortality in the first week due to egg handling. Um, mortality, normal mortality pattern in that middle week is typically nutrition related. We don't see that that much. And then um, if we see higher mortality than normal in that last week, um, typically that's when we look at incubation conditions. So on my chart, we can then categorize each of those things in that first week mortality, zero to three days, four to seven, midweek, eight, 14, um, last week, 15 to 18 or 19 to 21 with a, a distinction between those that were um, uh, pre-transfer and post-transfer. When I put use a sheet similar to this, I'm then able to go back and look at the results, tally up total mortality, early mortality, late, whatever, and I know each of the conditions we're measuring would fall into one of the categories, which would give me an opportunity to, to know a little bit more where to look when I'm trying to troubleshoot to troubleshoot that problem.